Our next witness is... Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Capacity Optimisation Group, formerly Airport Coordination Australia. That was a mouthful. Thank you for appearing. I feel like we said it g'day a couple of hours ago. You're still here. Yeah. Oh, right, OK. Can't kick me out. <laughs> right. All right, um, I now welcome representatives of Capacity Optimisation Group. I understand the information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses giving evidence to Senate committees has been provided to you both. For the Hansard record, would you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear today? And I'm going to take the lead here. Ladies first. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Petra Popovats. I'm the CEO of the Capacity Optimisation Group. Thank you. And my name's Giles Gunasakra, OIM. Um, I'm the Independent Director on Capacity Optimisation Group. One of the independent directors. Right, tremendous. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask uh, uh, both of you if you'd like to make a brief opening statement before we go to questions. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. Uh, thank you for allowing our company to appear today. Uh, in my address, I'll be speaking from a place of truth and fact. Something has been lacking in the public rhetoric around slots in recent times. The Capacity Optimisation Group is supportive of the changes to the Sydney Airport Demand Management Act. We are especially supportive of the changes to increase the transparency of the slot process. COG has always been extremely transparent with the stakeholders involved in the slot management process and allocates slots and provides data in accordance with the SADM and the WASG. The SADM? Sydney Airport Demand Management Act. And the other one? To World Airport Slot Guidelines. Beautiful. That's not for me, that's for everyone else out there. Oh, no problems. We just heard it a lot today, so I thought I'd make it shorter. It was shorter. for me. <laughs> However, viewing the misinformation and fabricated narratives spread by some members of the public across the media has highlighted just how little is understood about this highly technical and nuanced global system. I specifically question the remarks made by Rod Sims, as it is evident he lacks knowledge on the topic and is providing misleading information to the public. The truth of the matter is that Sydney is not a congested airport. There are slots available throughout the day. Rex received excellent slots in the peak for their domestic services, only to hand some back as they did not have the fleet to operate the slots they held. Bonza never asked for a single slot at Sydney, so they had no grounds to claim a slot issue at Sydney. They did, however, apply and were granted slots in Darwin and Melbourne, so they knew what the process was. Over the last few years, all new entrant airlines into Sydney have received, have received slots at times close to what they requested. The facts I've presented show that there is no slot issue in Sydney. In fact, Sydney is one of the least congested airports that we coordinate. Over the last 20 years, we've coordinated 47 airports in seven different countries. We have seen many highly congested airports, and Sydney is not one of them. COG also supports the measures in the new bill to shine a light on reasons for airline cancellations, a new reporting requirement in the entire industry, and the strengthening of the justified non-utilisation of slots criteria through a specific register for reasons for JNUS. Justified non-utilisation of slots. Thank you. Um, measures including reviewing parts of the JNUS, such as the Australian holiday period, and agreeing a method that will ensure fair use of the slot whilst continuing to support vital regional operations um, in off-peak periods. COG is also supportive of the changes to the compliance process at Sydney, something we've been passionate about improving for the last 10 years. COG is also supportive of improving data integrity by aligning data collection from a single source across the industry in Australia. We as a company have also heard the perceived conflicts with our company structure. We were set up 25 years ago in the same manner as other international coordinators such as the UK. However, what differs is that those coordinators, like the UK, are protected by their government and not subject to competitive processes, unlike Sydney. We realise that, like the SADM, we need to move with the times. With our new name comes a new independent chair and a new independent director and a willingness to change our perceived conflicts. We've always allocated slots in a neutral, non-discriminatory and independent manner, and we will continue to do so. 
We will continue to set the bar for slot coordination worldwide with, a, with our fair and professional practices, ensuring that we most effectively allocate the available capacity at all of our airports. We will continue to be audited by our clients, including Sydney Airport, that noted from an audit of our coordination this year that they would have lost opportunities through poorer capacity utilisation had they or others performed the allocation. We will continue to be industry leaders and provide high quality coordination using our experienced and skilled Australian staff. We will continue our advocacy work around the world to help coordinators, airlines, airports and regulators improve coordination practices. As CEO of COG and Chair of the World Airport Slots Board, I'm proud to represent our company and country on industry boards. Our strong reputation has led us to these prominent roles, allowing us to make a significant impact in the industry. Thank you for your time and I invite your thoughtful questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ms Popovic. Um, you certainly didn't hold back. We should have started with you today. That would have been, would have been real interesting. We got the order wrong there, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gunnar Carrot, did you wish to make any statement? No, sir. Well, after that, I'm not surprised. <laughs> you might as well leave the room, go get a coffee, mate. <laughs> OK, well, look, on that, I think that's going to trigger some questions. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Thank you both uh, for attending. I just want to understand the name change of the company. Sure. Um, so we decided to change our name um, because we are going under... So I have to be very careful with privacy at this point in time because obviously there is a tender out for the slot manager. So we're going through a lot of restructuring through our company and we wanted to change our name to um, show that that is, that is part of what we're doing and our commitment to change. OK, so you do recognise something needs to change because I was a bit confused by the opening statement. So there is, there's not an yeah. actual, um, there is a perceived bias that has, been, um, that has been noted. It's not an actual bias. We coordinate slots independently and non-discriminatorily. Mm. And outside Australia. Yeah, no, outside yeah, Australia. I understand yeah. the system. Um, so you've changed the name to reflect feedback on the perceived conflict of interest. Is Correct. that how I'm interpreting your evidence? Correct. It's also, um, it's also to support some of the company's structural changes. How so? I'm not sure whether I can answer that because of the probity issues with the tender. Well, maybe your independent director can. Uh, could you ask the question again? It was, what are the structural changes? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we have uh, two independent directors, myself mm -hmm. being one, and an independent chair. OK. Yep. And what's your background? Uh, so my background, I um, have worked in funds management and investments. I flew a plane and a glider before I could drive a car. Um, been around aviation for a long time, uh, but for about 30 years I've served on a variety of not-for-profit boards, mm -hmm. ranging from human rights to climate to theatre, arts, sport and a whole range of different organisations. So okay. bringing my governance background uh, to the organisation, but my love for, for aviation as well. Yep, fantastic. So the Minister's taken a fairly huge axe to your operating rules in this bill, <clears throat> as they stand. Why do you believe she's made the decision to make these regulatory changes? I think um, the regulation hasn't been uh, reviewed in 25, 27 years. And the times have changed, and the World Airport slot. Sorry, got... sorry, sorry. It was reviewed. Oh, in 2013. Yeah. Yes, correct. So yes. I mean, it sounds like yeah, you know sorry. this hasn't been looked at for three yes. decades is actually a false narrative. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes, it was reviewed in 2013, mm -hmm. and since then, 11 years later, um, it needs to be reviewed again because obviously there's there's been a lot of changes mm -hmm. to slot, the slot coordination rules worldwide in the World Airport Slot Guidelines. And I think it's really great that um, this bill um, is currently being looked at because uh, we have a chance to align ourselves to those global standards, which is great. Okay. So what deficiencies do you see with the current slot management system we have in place? I think... Um, Other than the perceived conflict of interest sure. that you've dealt with with the name change. Sure. Um, I think that um, an increase to um, new entrant access 
is fantastic and it aligns with the WASG. So what's wrong with the current system that doesn't allow new entrants? Yes. Oh, yeah. was getting there. Yeah, no, I know. But... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure thing. So currently um, a new entrant um, is considered five or more operations in a day at the airport. So that moves from five to seven. And they also increase the priority of new entrants um, up the priority chain, if you will, in the initial allocation of slots. So we heard evidence this morning that to actually be a sustainable operator in, this, in a country like this, and we've seen many come and go over time, you need between 30 and 40 slots at peak times into our busiest airport, which is Sydney, um, to actually, assuming you've got the number, right number of aircraft, but to actually make your business viable. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about increasing from five to... Can you just explain how the new entrants will actually be able to access 30 to 40 new slots as a result? Yeah, absolutely. So when we do the initial allocation, um, the historic slots are allocated first, and then currently um, in the old and system... And that won't change? No, that won't change, but that aligns with world standards. Um, so we're protecting the existing status quo of market share, essentially, into our busiest airport. However, um, airlines that wish to change historic slots, so have an 8 o'clock slot and want to operate at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, they will go down the, um, down the order and instead we will allocate new entrance slots first. So There's airlines... a disincentive to change your timetable because you'll lose the slot. Well, it just depends. It, it depends on whether you need to change a slot or you'd like to change a slot or something's happened in another port and you need to change your slot, but yeah. But it offers, a, it offers new entrants more um, access to the slots in the initial allocation. What's a slot worth? A slot is an intangible asset. But there are airlines who have uh, been able to quantify that. They've got it on their balance sheet. For, for intangible, one, some would say... Uh, almost like a MasterCard ad. Well, the you airline, can't operate an airline in yeah. this country without a bag of them. So the airline that was um, discussed was Ryanair, and they put, put a um, ledger on their balance sheet for Heathrow slots, which is mm -hmm. very different because Heathrow charge, there's a secondary bidding system in mm -hmm. Heathrow. So they might have actually paid $145 million, which I wouldn't be surprised, to acquire those slots. So that would go on their balance sheet if they've paid for those slots through secondary trading, which is something that they have in the UK, but something we don't have here. But if, if the evidence is correct, and I see no reason that it wouldn't be, that you need a certain base number of slots to access our busiest airport at peak times to be a sustainable airline in this country. We're sparsely populated, large distances, small number of people, to make a going concern of it, it doesn't become an intangible asset because it's a critical function of being able to operate in a country like this. We're not as densely populated or as small as European countries or indeed many states in the states. So um, why would you say it's an intangible um, intangible issue, and my understanding is Heathrow's, Heathrow's going through the same issues we're going through at the moment too. I think it's Probably for the same reasons. I think there's always been a question over the ownership of a slot. Who owns the slot? The airline thinks they own the slot because they operate into the airport. The airport thinks they own the slot because they have the facilities and the infrastructure. And the government thinks they own the slot or the regulator because they, um, they have the... Um, control of the airspace. So there's always a question about who actually owns the slot, and that's why it's an intangible, mm. intangible thing. Okay. So how can ACA ensure compliance with the new transparency requirements that are outlined in the bill to provide public confidence? So we're already doing that. So there's a new stand, uh, statement of expectations by the department that we're working with them and, and are already already providing to them, as you'll see changes on our website um, that align with those statement of expectations. We're also working with the department as well um, and other, um, other stakeholders on the um, transparency of airline cancellations and how that's going to work in the regulation. So nothing's changed yet? There are things you're working on? No, no. That our transparency has changed on our website. Right. Um, the, because of the uh, regulations need to be looked at in the bill, 
as to the airline cancellations, that, that has not been done yet because that's something to be worked on with this bill. Okay. And what's your stance on the um, recovery period that will allow 85 um, movements? I think we absolutely need the recovery period. Um, I think it allows consumers to be able to get home in really bad weather situations. Um, and I also think that um, at four o'clock the day before operation, Air Services goes through an ATFM program. And if we can somehow relieve some of that ATFM, some of that cancellation that's happened already, and be able to help that on the day and create less cancellations, that's a, that's a really powerful thing. So I'm really supportive of, of the uh, recovery period. You heard the earlier evidence from community groups about what triggers a recovery period. What um, is your view on that? I think it has to be um, a very distinctive and large weather event, and I think it's going to be. I think it would be something that needs to be handled very carefully by air services and, and by the regulations that are put in as well. Only a weather event, or a major disruption like IT, <laughs> or IT, or mm. what happened with Qantas the other day, something yeah. like that. Okay, you know. so yeah, that's. And would the slot manager have any role to play in determining the triggers? No, because that happens on the day of operation, so that's out of our purview. Because we so hand who, over. The who would would play a role in sort of saying, righto, it's Air Services Australia alone, or in will I they have to? I think it would be in consultation with the airport and the airlines as well. Um, what about the civil penalties? What procedural steps need to be in place? Um, so we already manage a civil penalty um, regulation as it is now. Um, but you've never handed out. It's never. My understanding is we've never actually handed out a penalty. 100% because it got stuck within the legal framework. So we did have situations 10 years ago um, that we did want to find an airline, and it was deemed um, not possible due to the way that the regulation was structured. So that's something that. Um, is, is legislation will address that? Yes. So, and was advice provided to change that regulation? Sorry? Was advice provided to decision makers to change that regulation? Yes, by yes. Not, just my, not just our company, but yeah. by most of the Stay industry. across yeah. the board. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's the process now? Um, you got, you're in a tender. Mm -hmm. When is that going to be completed? Uh, I'm not sure. So, are you running the tender, or is oh, no. your board, no, the, or the minister, the, or no, the department is the department's yeah. running? Mm -hmm. And you don't know, but you put in for it. Yes. Right. And do you know if you've got any competitors? I would assume I would. Yes, we would. We would, or you? Sorry, we as a company would. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Excellent. Just checking. It's very um, personal identity there. Um, so um, my understanding is the tender it, it is when would you be expected to be, if you don't know when it closes, et cetera, when, it, when is it expected to be operational by? Um, the 1st of April. Okay. Has right. been what's been touted at this point in time. Right. So the, the tender is closed, but we're waiting in a decision. decision. Right. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yep. So that potentially could be after the next election. Uh, I believe a decision would. I, I don't want to speculate, so know. I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. Lots of happening after the election, it would seem. <laughs> um, what feedback? What, what no. feedback? Well. <laughs> Um, I don't know. You would know more than I, being <laughs> better friends with Premier Cook. Um, Absolutely. Good friend of mine. Yeah, no. I would assume so. I would assume nothing less. Um, what feedback or input did you provide to um, the Minister in terms of drafting the bill? Um, so we provided our um, submission and, and feedback that way. We also have fortnightly uh, meetings with the department, so um, we've provided some some input in through So that. just want to be really clear, because your opening statement was like nothing's we've done a great job and nothing's wrong and then but you really support the bill. So yep. it does I want to give you the opportunity to clarify. Absolutely. So where you stand. we have done a great job in the conf in the structure of what is the the SADM. 
So we've, we've done a great job in the rules that we currently have, but we support the new rules coming in as well. And if we do get chosen, we'll do a great job of those new rules as well, because we're already using them in a lot of our other countries. And, and obviously declaring the fact that you're abs um, in a process right now to be chosen. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and giving that evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, ah, did you ha do you have a Beyond and Chairman's Lounge membership? No. No? <laughs> no. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. You hand me your mouth, are you? Can I just... Um, can I just... Uh, can I I just there, I'm waiting yeah. to get mine taken off me. <laughs> Keep going. Senator Popper... Uh, Senator, sorry, I've just demoted you, Miss Popper. But, um, um, help me out. Is it, and, and, and this is not scripted questions. I just... Because your opening statement really opened my, my ears. Um, and I'm led to believe... And if I'm wrong, someone can pull me up. We'll correct the record. But I thought one of the biggest issues Rex had was access to slots. Did I get that wrong? They got really great domestic slots. No, no, I, I, I'm not saying... Yeah. But wasn't... Didn't we all read that in the papers? Yeah, that's incorrect narratives made up by people that aren't true. And I never got a call from anyone saying, can you please back this up and, and actually, you know, tell me what's happening. I was as surprised as you when I read that because I'm like, well, that's just not the well, truth. You know well, you know the so outcome. The I don't. Is. I honestly <laughs> have. Look, I came into this hearing today thinking that you guys were the baddies and you denied opposition, yeah. not opposition, competition to Qantas and Virgin around those peak periods, and that's the first time I've heard that is not the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, understand okay. how long you've actually been in the role. Uh Myself as CEO? Yeah. Ten years. Ten years? I've been at, AC, at COG for 20 years. AOC. And just Would as we did, yeah, and you... Um, you were at ACA for 20 years. COG for, well... What's COG? <laughs> new Our name. new group, uh, capacity oh, optimisation group. I'm really confusing you, I apologise. <laughs> so I'll just correct the record, you weren't at COG, uh, at COG for 20 years. you've been with the same entity for 20 years. Yeah. 20 yeah. Years. Sorry, the same entity for 20 years, <laughs> yes. very similar to um, the Chief Executive of Air Services Australia. He'd been in there for a long time too, hadn't he? Uh, Mr Hartwell, you're talking about? Yes. No, he took over probably 10. about... Yeah, about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank Can you... Very much. So, so if we just come back and look if it's if there's if it's out of order, don't answer it. That's fine. But would and there was quite, you were in the room as public and you heard me asking some questions because I was actually really had no idea how this was yeah. all happening behind the scenes. But would it be unusual for a startup or someone wanting to take on you know, flights in and out of Sydney or any other airport? And we want them to. We want competition. But would it be unusual for them to come to COG and say? before they start buying planes and painting them up and advertising and would it be unusual for them to knock on your door and say, can we see what access to slots we would get if we were to mm -hmm. enter this market? It's actually the opposite of that. So it's unusual for them not to ask. So we've had one airline that's looking to enter the Australian market for about 10 years and I sit down with them maybe once or twice a year to give them an overview of what the slot availability looks like. Not oh. just in Sydney, but in other ports in Australia as well. So oh, we're, we're very supportive of, of new entrants and, and yeah. domestic growth. I am just gobsmacked that, that what, you've, what evidence you've given. And I have no reason to, no reason to doubt you. No, no. Anyway. We just okay. haven't been asked. You know? yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, just those lazy journos at the Murdoch <laughs> trash media that should have got off their fat backsides and gone out and asked Steady questions. On. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't absolutely, like and, and you are it. continuing in. The Hang on, I'm the boss. You're telling me off, Archie Petra. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so it's, you're in the family business. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll leave my questions there, but I don't, I, you know, I don't think you need to be trashing the media. Why not? Oh, it just doesn't. It's not helpful. I'm allowed. <laughs> Some would think they get off their lazy fat backsides and go ask questions. All right. Um, thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much for your thank evidence you. and take care. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Jeez, I've hit rock bottom when you're telling me off. Bridget, what's going on? What? Um, now, I'll call.